The role of Jax was something that Erica had dreamed up after she and I had worked together on a short film called Little Chief. And really the character came before the story. Erica had a vision for the kind of character she wanted Jax to be. She want, wanting me to play it and of course me wanting to play her. However, however that manifested. And then um, she had, she knew she wanted um, an auntie and a niece story and she wanted the story to end or have a big feature at least of the two dancing together and that was it. Um, after working on Little Chief with Erica, I knew I would do anything she would do. I was hoping she would say that she had a feature in mind. Um, and luckily she did. She writes, she writes in such a beautiful way that, you know, actors, when we get a script like anything Erica writes, we're just chomping at the bit to do it because it's so layered. It's not overdrawn. It's um, a lot of room for you to fill in on your own. But when I did get the final script and saw what this idea of a character would become that I always knew I would play, it was um, one of those, again, one of those moments where you get a script and you're just locked in from page one to page 92 or whatever the page count was originally. And I was so drawn into it. It's one of the it's one of the screenplays that has stayed super true to the original read to every frame that you see in the film because it was just so crafted. It was so um, built with love. It was so specific. Um, and Jax, who she ended up being, I was so relieved to see that this character was not a model minority, had flaws, had um, clearly a backstory that she had worked really hard to... Um, to overcome, um, to do better for her family, for her niece, um, and kind of struggled with that. And I loved the sort of reluctant return into the belly of the beast that she had clearly in a previous time before we meet her had crawled her way out of, um, but for what's necessary in the given circumstances in their world going back in for the love of her sister. And then of course, for the love of her niece, the relationship between Jax and Roki, I thought was such a great love story that we rarely get to see. Um, it's the commitment to family, to continuity of culture, and to just keeping these two together. Um, it was really moving and one that is very understood and very universally felt, but you rarely get to see an experience in film. So I was really excited to go on the entire journey. And then for the whole time, just curious, curious, who's going to be Roki? Who's going to be our Roki? Who's going to be our Roki? And um, Erica Isabel came across her desk for a different project and ultimately was a little young for that one, but perfect, read perfectly for the age of Roki and carried the kind of sophistication that was necessary to really land the, um, the subtleties and the nuances and the... Um, the maturity that Roki needed to have, um, you know, being a girl who's raised in a household where everybody pitches in, um, she learns to be independent pretty young. So it was a hard thing to try and find somebody who carried that youthful, you believe that she, you know, you believe that she really believes in um, the best possible outcome. You believe that she believes her mom is uh, going to come to this powwow. It's like you need to have somebody who has that bright-eyed sort of innocence, but also this wizened soul underneath it. And I was very curious <laughs> who, who would turn up. And then when um, I, I met Isabel on set, we never even had a chemistry read. Erica mm -hmm. just knew so immediately it was going to be her. So, yeah. <laughs> Your turn. My <laughs> turn. Yeah, you know, Roki... She's so young, and I think that getting to play a character that age was so fun because it really reminded me of myself at that age, and it reminded me of my cousins and my younger sibling, and it made me really happy to see that because she has that joy and she has that light and that curiosity, but she's just so quiet, <laughs> and I love her so much. And I think that that quiet but intentional presence was what really drew me to the role because 
she has her whole own little world inside her mind that you don't really get to hear ever, but you can really see it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's just like props to Erica because, you know, the writing of it, like you said, it's not overstated. It's, it's, it's just enough. It's lovely to read and to play with. Um, yeah. And yeah. the combination of Erica and Michiana created such a lived in world for us to step into and such a, you know, something that's so real. You know, both of them are such um, anchors in their families and their communities. Um, both have nieces, nephews, um, niblets <laughs> that they, <laughs> that they, um, that they care for, that look up to them. Um, so drawing that relationship was really a beautiful thing. I loved how genre it was too, mm -hmm. like getting the script, um, knowing that Erica and Michiana, even though her writing was new to me, could create this world that was very um, minimal in a lot of ways, um, not demonstrative, just everything was created and allowed to be, but also that it's had a genre element. It had intrigue. It had suspense. I f one of my favorite movies to watch when I was a kid was Paper Moon with my dad. And um, it was lovely to see that there was something like Paper Moon or something like Thelma and Louise out there for an indigenous, uh, an indigenous space um, created for us to have some fun with. So. Mm -hmm. I'm so grateful that this film is going to have the reach that it's going to have because I think a lot of the themes in it, I think a lot of elements of the world that we meet these characters living in, a vast, um, a vast number of people worldwide will understand it, will resonate with it, will see themselves in it in some way. And then also it will help focus a lens that there's been recent interest, um, like just coming out of having this beautiful season and reception for Killers of the Flower Moon, um, knowing that Fancy Dance is going to sit on the same platform, is going to queue up after an audience watches Killers of the Flower Moon, and um, has been given this gift of this family of indigenous women that love each other um, tremendously, that suffered incredible atrocity. And um, I think watching that film, audiences who do fall in love with the Kyle sisters, who do fall in love with the Osage family and the characters in that, are oftentimes left wanting to spend more time in that world, wanting more answers, wanting more of that. And then having Fancy Dance queuing up right after it, a hundred years later, taking place in the same land, same issues that haven't gone anywhere. Missing murdered indigenous peoples did not start in the 1920s in the era of Killers of the Flower Moon, and it certainly hasn't gone anywhere. Um, it's something that touches every indigenous life, and it's one of the bigger issues for us. It's something we all have an awareness of. You'd be hard pressed to find any indigenous person that doesn't know a missing or murdered indigenous relative. Um, yet it still shocks people when they learn about it. Um, so... Also, um, you know, learning about how different elements of, um, of our history have, have also not gone anywhere. The, um, I hope audiences get a glimpse into a world that they maybe are unfamiliar with, but will feel familiar. That's how you build empathy. That's how you understand your place in the world and understand other people's place in the world. Um, and yeah, it'll um, expand the lens of what people know is possible. Mm -hmm. And what I think is so great is that Jax and Roki and their stories and even just the way that they are, it's so real and it's so lived in because these stories are so real. And, you know, so many people, even just in North America, you know, we we're on indigenous land. And so the fact that so many people are still so unaware of these stories and, you know, how close to home they are, they, I think this film gives people an opportunity to actually do that work and do that learning. And I just hope that after watching it, they just want 
to learn more. And there's that desire to put in the work because, you know, it's happening all around us all the mm -hmm. time. And yeah, so I'm just very grateful to be a part of it. <laughs> I was really inspired by my language learning. Uh, I'm a member of the Seneca Cayuga Nation and I wanted to learn my ancestral language Cayuga. And while learning that language, I was really inspired by like the way that the grammar and syntax and uh, the way that that language came together really showcased the matrilineal kinship and matriarchy of the Haudenosaunee. And um, I was inspired to see a modern day world where young people speak the language fluently and where matrilineal kinship is the backbone of the community. And so I just saw this image of an auntie and a niece dancing. Um, and it was, you know, then fun for my co-writer Michiana and I to figure out how to get them there. Michiana and I set out to tell a story about Native women in modern America. And uh, we really wanted to focus on the relationship between this aunt and this niece, between these two women. Um, but as we were developing the story, we thought that it would, you know, well, essentially, as a Native person, you can't really let go on social media or, you know, as members of your community, you're seeing, like, missing posters all the time. It's just like a part of... of of what it means to be native in 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 a in a modern time and we thought that it was important to showcase um that epidemic with the film but focus on um you know it's not a procedural in terms of like we're going to beat you over the head with like lessons about things um but moreover it focuses in on the humanity of these two characters who are surviving this epidemic that is so very much um uh, happening and existing in, in real time right now in America. Uh, and so we were focused on the families that are left behind in this epidemic versus, you know, trying to like go in and, um, I guess mine for, for trauma. Uh, we're really focused on the joy of these two individuals and how their love and connection with each other helps them survive these kind of oppressive forces that are, that are um, weighing down on them uh, uh, outside of their control. Um, well, what's it like working with Lily Gladstone? Uh, amazing, wonderful, heaven. Uh, Lily is just absolutely incredible. We had collaborated on a short film called Little Chief prior to this and really built a strong working relationship, but also a really great friendship. And I absolutely love collaborating with Lily. Lily is so generous and smart and funny and just giving uh, is the only way to describe describe them as an actor. And uh, I always say that if if I did nothing else uh, with if I if I accomplished nothing else with this film, it was to bring uh, Lily and Isabel together as human beings and friends and. They just had such an incredible chemistry right off the bat. Uh, we were, they did language immersion in the morning and dance classes in the afternoons, and they were just instant buddies. Uh, which I think that chemistry and like their charisma came across in their uh, portrayals of of Jax and Roki as well. Um, but what a true um, as a director, it was such a gift to work with such talented actors who are bringing to life characters um, from this like beautiful inner world that they're able to create uh, as performers. And um, yeah, I mean, despite the fact that we were filming in Oklahoma in like a 90 degree heat wave, um, I just remember it so fondly and the partnerships between the three of us uh, and the rest of our collaborators. I just, you know, it was a, a wonderful experience on set and so great to celebrate our accomplishments now with a finished film. Well, this was the first feature screenplay that I ever wrote uh, with my co-writer, Michiana. It was the first, you know, feature I ever completed 
uh, as a script, and it was also my first feature that I ever directed. So I've learned a lot of lessons. <laughs> uh, it was very uh, uh, formative, and it taught me so much about collaboration. It taught me so much about trusting your partners. It taught me so much about how to be um, in the editing room, how to be with the actors, how to be, you know, uh, an advocate for myself, for my vision, for my culture, for my community, for the script, for my, you know, for the film. Um, and I think one of the things I'm really going to walk away as an indigenous creator um, is how important it was to be a producer on the film as well. Um, you know, to direct and write, you have the ability to create and to, you know, create a vision. Um, but it's so important, I think, for um, Native uh, filmmakers to also have control over their project as producers and to have final says on things and to be the one who's really, you know, uh, able to um, protect and to um, usher in that that creative vision as an, you know, that indigeneity into the film. Uh, and I, I always say that I'm not the... Um, I'm not the keeper, I'm not the owner of my culture, and it was always important to me to be able to like go back to my community and ask questions, and it was important for me to have those final votes and the final says about things in my film, um, because I have to go back to my community, and I have to, I have to go back to my elders, and I need them to be proud and to, to see what is represented in, in an authentic way. So I learned a lot about, um, about that side of things as well. Yeah, you know, Michiana and I, from the jump, we just made a commitment to write what is true and to write like experiences that either we had had or that our family had had um, or people in our community had had. And um, it just was a part of the process from the get-go. Um, I was sharing parts of the script very early on with people in my community, with faith keepers, with cultural, um, you know, the cultural director of my nation. Um, it, it's so important to be responsible. You know, I think Hollywood has long treated Native American stories with just this like deplorable behavior and, you know, written things that were untrue, cast people who were not Native, had people, you know, creating these stories that had no knowledge or had done such little research into our communities. And, you know, myself and so many of my peers working in the industry, we just take it so seriously to get these things right. And we don't do it alone. You know, we reach out to our communities. We do the research. You, you know, in, we have a couple of moments of ceremony in this, in this film. And it was so important to me to work with faith keepers to make sure that I was portraying it correctly and that certain things I wasn't showing that they didn't feel comfortable putting out into the world. And because of that communication, because of that respect, for the culture and because of being in the know of that culture, you're able to really express things in a very freeing way. And the community and the culture come to life very authentically because it's a part of the writing, it's a part of the directing, it's a part of the indigenous crew members that are on the set. And, you know, I remember the day that we were doing the removal scene of Roki where CPS comes and removes her. You know, we were taking a long time in between takes. We had people on set and medicines on set because so many people in the crew and in the cast had experienced these things or witnessed these things. And it was a really heavy day. But I, I call it our superpower in a way that because we've experienced these things, we're able to come onto set and treat it so carefully and to be so um, precious with our hearts and with our spirits. And in the end, you have a scene that feels so kind of terrifying and gripping because we were putting all of our <laughs> all of our real experiences into the scene while allowing Jax and Roki to re retain their humanity uh which I think is is a real key and is a um is a great outcome when you tell stories authentically you really can retain the humanity of your characters I had never heard it put that way before, 100 plus countries. Um, 
wow, it feels so big. It feels like such an accomplishment. It feels um, truly inspiring. I think, you know, when you think of just the language piece of it, the idea that Cayuga is going to be heard. Sorry, it just caught me emotional. Um, it's such a big deal, you know? Like, we, we've worked so hard to reclaim these things that were stolen from us and to know that the language will be heard around the world is so huge. And then also just, you know, as a girl from the Seneca Cuga Reservation in Oklahoma, um, it can seem like such a small place on the map, but it's such a big place in my heart and in my nation's heart. So I know that being able to be represented and have have this beautiful uh, culture, language, and this beautiful you know place on earth that that's that we call home as Seneca Cuga, to have that just have our little <laughs> have that little blip on the map globally like known about is such a big deal and um i hope that it uh, is i hope that it in allows let me rephrase that i hope that this big moment is not only opening doors for me and our film but i hope that like more native folks including myself get to make more stories and that that people recognize the global appetite for stories about Native Americans and um, authentically told Native American stories. So I don't know what a blubbering, crying, weird answer to your question, but I'm so moved <laughs> that, that this is a reality. Thanks for watching. Make sure to like and comment on the video if you enjoyed it. Subscribe to the channel and hit the notification bell to be notified when new videos are released.